If you ask anyone today what the first thing is that comes to mind when they think of Scotland, the answer you will probably hear, from anyone outside of Scotland at least, is the clans. For potentially a thousand years, the clans of the Scottish Highlands, and some in the Lowlands, effectively controlled the lands and people of the nation. Today they remain as a rebranded kinship meant to unite people of shared ancestry and heritage. In this video we will look at what happened to the Scottish clans, and how did the Scottish clan system collapse. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of non-fiction movies and shows from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. CuriosityStream has millions of subscribers and new shows every week on history, science, tech, military history, and more. I just watched The Daunting Fortress of Richard the Lionheart, an incredibly well-made documentary about the impregnable castle that was the emblem of the might of Richard I, which protected his lands in France and helped him assert his supremacy in Normandy. And as our viewer, you get a special discount on CuriosityStream. Click the link below to visit curiositystream.com slash historymarsh for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series Use the code HISTORYMARSH when you sign up to get a 25% discount, which comes out to only $15 a year. That's just $1.25 per month, much cheaper than other streaming services. Stay curious with CuriosityStream. Before we begin, it helps to first understand how the clan system of old worked. Although Scottish historians generally feel that we don't have an extensive amount of knowledge about the structure of the clans as a unit, we do know the basics. It's believed that the earliest clans were established around the start of the 12th century, and some of these early clans were actually founded by foreigners. For example, one of the largest and most powerful clans throughout the Highlands, and even spanning through the Lowlands, were the Gordons. Today, this clan is frequently referred to as the House of Gordon, oftentimes in reference to the fact that they actually began as a family of foreigners, likely from Normandy. The Camerons of Clan Cameron were additionally Anglo-Normans to start, and others such as the Galbraiths were descendants of ancient Britons, and the Frasers, one of the most popular today, were French. Maybe because of this, or just because of the way the nation was at that time, many clansmen were known to be loyal to their clan first and country second, which in itself tells us a lot about the system. These men, whether through pride or another kind of loyalty, were willing to fight and even die for their clan and chief. And the chief, who served as the leader of each clan, was often viewed with the same esteem as royalty by his kinfolk. Many members of the clans who were not directly related to the chief would also take his surname as a show of loyalty and a way of securing their protection from the clan, because that is essentially what these groups were meant to do. When it comes to organization, instead of being a typical feudal landowning society, the clan system was based on relationships and loyalty. Whether family members to the chief, Septs or others who would be brought into a clan, the job of the clan was to protect these people and their holdings, in exchange for complete loyalty to the chief, and favours such as fighting his battles whenever called upon. And battles were common in the clan system, due to the limited usable land within Scotland at the time, and the vast number of clans whose territories often butted up against each other. Conflict was a normal occurrence, and clansmen would battle fiercely in the name of their clan and chief. The kings of Scotland were also known to take advantage of friendships that they would build with certain chiefs, later calling upon them to bring their troops into battle for the crown's cause as well. Essentially, though oftentimes the cause of bloody warfare and tit-for-tat massacres, the clan system was remarkably successful at establishing what in some cases resembled individual kingdoms, 
or other times comprehensive family units that would piece together nearly the whole of the Scottish Highlands and parts of the Lowlands. But, as evident by the current structure of Scotland, the clan system has been dead and gone for some time, and this was not by chance. The collapse of the Scottish clan system is generally viewed to have begun after the final clash of the Jacobite uprising, but this is not entirely true. The clans had still existed and were more or less alive and well by the 18th century, but they were already beginning to change. One influence that contributed to their slow evolution was the actions of James VI once he took the throne of the Scots and in England. Untrusting of the clans, he started to require that their chiefs attend court annually in Edinburgh, in addition to other provisions involving some Highlanders being educated in the Lowlands and adopting the new religion of England. Life in the capital and beyond had a swift effect on these clansmen and leaders, who had never really had to live the kind of life that was required of them when they came to the court and lowlands. Many view this as one of the true early factors that began to weaken the clan structure through the changing of its chiefs and members. But still, the biggest blow to the clans and the world they had created came after the 45 rebellion. The Battle of Culloden, the final bloody and devastating battle of the rebellion, which put an end to the hopes of Bonnie Prince Charlie and all who supported him, marked the final hours of not only the Jacobite dream, but also of the Scottish clans as everyone knew them. Given the incredible number of Highlanders who had participated in the uprising against the British Crown, and the fact that these clansmen were not by any means known for giving up so easily, the British authorities began to do whatever they could to collapse the entire clan system that gave these Highlanders their power to begin with. Around this time, a large chunk of what soon became the early Scottish diaspora left the Highlands for Ulster, the New World colonies, or elsewhere. These immigrants would later play a significant role in the fate of the clans, but for now, we need to take a look at what they were fleeing from. Once the 45 Rebellion was crushed, one of the most immediate actions taken by the British Crown was the passing of the Act of Proscription, which came into effect on August 1, 1746, only a few months after the Culloden disaster. It was essentially an updated version of an earlier disarming act that had a similar aim the goal now was to completely assimilate and suppress the clans, their system, culture, and members. In addition to attempting to ban the Highlanders from possessing weaponry, this time the Monumental Dress Act was added, which is pointed to by many historians as being one of the most significant and damning actions taken by the British government in their assimilation efforts. The Dress Act entirely banned the wearing of Highland dress by anyone outside of the army, where the Black Watch Regiment had already established its own tradition of a kilted uniform. This meant that, although many of the Clan Tartans we know today were made after the Dress Act would later be repealed, Highlanders could no longer wear the tartan of their time, and their kilts would also be unacceptable. And the punishment for non-compliance? Jail. And if any such Highlander continued to wear their traditional dress just once more, indentured servitude overseas. But this wasn't the only thing that helped the Crown dismantle the clan system and its culture. The Highland clearances also had a devastating impact on Highland life, as the Scots knew it. The Highland clearances began in the 18th century, following Culloden, and went on for roughly a century marking a period of sudden and excess emigration of Scottish Highlanders from the Highlands. For the most part, this was due to different effects of the agriculture revolution in Scotland, but there was one factor that highlighted the already occurring changes to the clan system as it once was. In the past, the clans had given their members the inalienable right to rent land within their clan's territory, which would mean that the tenants who were forced to emigrate during the clearances by their landlords or chiefs were essentially being betrayed by their own clan, something that in the past 
would have been unfathomable. But this was a shift that had potentially begun all the way back in 1609, with the statutes of Iona, when James VI started his campaign to change the clans and their chiefs from Edinburgh. Despite the shock and anger from many clansmen, the damage had already been done, and the ball was rolling. The Highlands would never be the same. Even though the Dress Act would be repealed before the close of the 18th century, and Scotland would later undergo a period of traditional revival, life would never recover for the clans. Highland dress would eventually be restored as a traditional wear for special occasions, but it was no longer daily wear for really anyone. The clans no longer held the territory or power that they once had. The Gaelic language was fading under the growing use of English in the lowlands and highlands, and with vast numbers of clansmen having left the country, or even the continent entirely, it was clear that the days of the clan system in Scotland were no more. But this would not be the end of the clans entirely. We mentioned earlier that some of the diaspora had left while the clan structure that they had always known was still alive. Little did they know it, these Highlanders were about to play a crucial role in preserving their traditions and heritage, and making it a global phenomenon. Upon arriving in their new countries, for many, their clan identity was all that they knew. Remember that a large number of these Highlanders were loyal first to their clan, and then to their nation. Not only this, but the biggest uniting factor between these immigrants in a new world across the ocean, far from all they'd ever called home, was their status as clansmen. This gave them an instant community in a strange place, and can be demonstrated on a large scale by the American and Canadian Highland Games Festival, dating all the way back to the early 1800s. Furthermore, since clan life was all that these immigrants knew, it also accounted for the only heritage they had to pass down to their descendants in their new homes. This is why even today, we see Highland Games, official clan organizations, kilt and tartan wearing and so on, really anywhere that a decent chunk of the earlier diaspora went. So, though rebranded and modernized, by all means in the diaspora, the clans live on. But the case in Scotland differs. Given the way that the nation itself changed and adapted following the emigration of the early diaspora, it's no surprise that the heritage of modern Scots did as well. Of course, some Scottish citizens today still speak Gaelic or celebrate their clan, but for the most part, this area of history created a startling divide between Scots and the diaspora. Although many clans still have their chiefs in Scotland, who often directly or indirectly supervise or recognize their clan's official organizations and overseas branches today, most Scots view it all as a thing of the past. While the heritage of the diaspora remains encapsulated in the days of the mighty clans, today's Scots have a whole new identity and heritage that was birthed after the collapse of the clan system. Because, even though the tradition of the clans may live on abroad or at home, the reality is that the true Scottish clan system fell apart nearly three centuries ago, and it will never be what it once was. If you've made it this far into the video, thank you for watching. And if you'd like to support our work like all these amazing people do, head over to our Patreon page, where you can get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as one dollar. Or you can support us by subscribing to our channel and leaving a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. As always, we'll see you in the next one.